Welcome back to Nick Lance's Comic Corner Classic Class Non Classic. This is episode number 1456, double shot number 1350. What am I reviewing with my 1350 double shots? Why, two Marvel trades. The first one is the finale for Ryder's third run of the series. Yes, third run. First up it is Hulk World War Hulk 2. Yep. World War Hulk 2. This collects Incredible Hulk number 714 to 717. Yes, a four part storyline. That's a sequel to a mini series that came out back in 2007. This came out 10 years after that. Well, actually, it was more like 11 years. Yeah, this thing starts off basically. We have the Armadeus Cho Hulk and the Unworthy Thor returning to Earth after the after the Planet Hulk 2 storyline. And he come back to Earth and he's a bit out of a control. But not to the point that the original Hulk basically was known for doing back in the original World War Hulk story. He has a fight in the Champions, several Avengers, and he is going completely out of control. And, of course, his sister Maddie, of course, basically is involved with this, too. Mostly just, like I said, Champions, a little bit of Avengers, and Alpha Flight 2. They try to calm him down. He's completely out of control. But thanks to Maddie, they're able to mostly depower the Hulk. And, of course, Armadeus Cho is stuck in the Hulk form. Mainly because the Hulk is, is basically driving the car. Yep, and then later on the car itself was eventually destroyed. After Armadeus Cho gets out of the trunk... He's chased by the Hulk, and of course, of course, this isn't Hulk's mind. Eventually, the car itself is destroyed, and then, of course, Hulk gets the power, returned basically to a more slimmer Armadeus Cho. Yep, much more slimmer guy. And that's it. Yeah, he becomes broad out this. He is no more Hulk anymore. If you're curious, though, what happened next? It was Immortal Hulk. Ran right for the events of No Surrender. Yep, an excellent storyline, which basically had Mark Wade, Jim Zeb, I think uh, David Walker got handled in this book, and Al Ewing, which brought back the original Hulk at the dead at that point, about two years. And of course, we have the awesome, critically acclaimed Immortal Hulk book. That came next right after this wrapped up. Of course, this book also contained World Hulk number one, which I have previously reviewed. It's an excellent event. Now, in the case of this book overall, it's pretty decent what it was. I mean, for one thing, Greg Land is not on the artwork. You might think, but the cover, it's Greg Land's artwork. But from what I see on here, no, it isn't. Uh, this artwork here is actually Frank Cho's artwork. Which you're probably thinking, really? It's Frank Cho? Who does his cover art? Yeah, it's Frank Cho. Who does the cover art for issue number 200, oh, 717. Oh yeah, after he gets the power, he's briefly held in custody by the by New York. But he has to pay like a lot of money from pay for any damage, which... Didn't seem like reading this book. Seemed like there was not a lot of damage per se. It was like maybe a couple blocks, but yeah, it's not that much damage. Also, fun little factoid: this cover here, seven fourteen. This is a mod to World War Hulk number one, which they actually have in here. Oh yeah, they have it in here. Which you probably are like really? Yeah, they do. Because look, here's seven fourteen, right here. And here's World War Hulk number one. Clearly a homage, which... Yeah, I thought that was so cool. The fact that it actually homage this. Like, the only difference is, is that Hulk is not wearing his, his gladiatory armor. Yeah. But this book, it's just, just really good. I, I, I kind of like it. It's a pretty decent story for what it is. But it's a pretty interesting ending to Greg Pak's second run of the... Uh, th not second, third run of the book. Yeah, third run. I give this book roughly a 9 out of 10. Yep. Now, final thoughts on this particular run. Yeah, originally this was Totally Awesome Hulk. It lasted for 23 issues 
and then was retired of this. Though I do have a few trades to collect it. Like this book here. Weapon X Volume 1. Weapons Mutant Destruction Prelude. Which contained issue number 19. And of course you also have the crossover. Which contained issues 20 and 22. Yep, basically was gearing toward the end of this book. Yeah, in the case of the Hulk itself, it was gearing toward this. Mm -hmm. Excuse me. Planet, Return to Planet Hulk. Yeah. But yeah, that's pretty much the end of Greg Pox run. And thanks to reviewing this book here, I can now basically say every far back as 2013 for Hulk. Yes, 2013. Once I get done Greg Pox's second run for the book, I can pretty much say I got as far back as 20... Actually, it was like 2008. Yeah. His his third one was interesting at best. And the way it's written here is that when Greg Powell was actually offered this, he, he accepted right away. And of course, he was writing the Hulk at this point. Now, I have reviewed the, the three trades that pretty much collect the entire original run. Yeah, there's about three trades that collect Totally Awesome Hulk. Yep. And I view those digitally via the poll app. And now I'm pretty much viewing the, like, the last couple trades that collect the run. Now, I did review those other two trades via Wolfstock Weapon X. But I had to talk about here. The only else loose connected to Greg Pox over Hulk is Hulk Vereens, which is really good. It has good humor in it because Greg Pox is great with humor. He's one of those writers who is fantastic with humor. Yep. Oh, in case you're curious, though, what the guy. What is it? What is he doing at Marvel now? He is actually no, that's actually not not it's not the expert. What is he doing well right now? He's doing Darth Vader. Yep, Darth Vader. You are thinking, really? He's writing a Star Wars book? By the second one he's written. And it's really good. Yeah, that's what he's doing at Marvel right now. I mean I don't think he worked in there. I think the only book he worked on like I think like Raft this run wrapped up. I think the only book he was working on was Weapon X. And once book wrapped up, and of course he was also working on uh, Weapon H, which was really good, which led to Hulk for Reigns. And after that, he didn't do very much until he did Star Wars, now Darth Vader. Yep. I always like his Hulk books. It was just really good. And I assume we'll be getting him Planet Hulk. That'd be interesting to get into. All right. Moving on to a mini series as a tie into an event. This is Empire X Men. I took a heck out of my head like, how many mini series has the X Men had a mini series tie into it? This is the sixth, yes, sixth event Marvel has done where the X-Men had a mini-series tied to the very event. The first one, Civil War 1. Next one, okay, what was the next one? Uh, actually, it's more like seven. You have War Hulk X-Men, which is actually not canon, yeah, because everybody's not canon. Secret Invasion X-Men. Chaos War X-Men. I think next one after that was... I think it was Civil War II X-Men, War of the Realms, and now this. All those previous miniseries had one writer on it. One writer. This one has got several writers. For five, for four issues. You have Jonathan Hickman who does issues one and four. Though he co-writes issue number one with Tina Howard. Yeah, it's like with this one, he had like every single person writing the X-Books at this point. Writing this miniseries because of the tie to Empire. Yeah. The second issue is done by Gary Duggan, Ben Percy, and Leah Williams. If you're curious what books these series work on, Ben Percy works on Wolverine and X-Force. Gary Duggan works on Marauders. Leah Williams is writing X-Factor. Vealta does New Mutants. Zeb Wells does Hellions. Ed Bronson, I don't think he works on anything right now. Not that I can think of, no. The art for these issues is different every issue. Issue 1 is Matto Berrafi. Second issue is Lucas Warnock. Third, Andrea Barricho. And the last one, Jorge Melilla and Lewis Warnock, who did, did issue 2. Now, it seems as though it's like whatever the X-Men were up to during this event. Yeah, this one was quite weird, to say the least. Like, this is the event that brought back Mandrix Prime, Multiple Man. Yeah, and he's back in the outfit he wore during Peter David's X-Factor run. 
No, not the goofy attire that he wore during the 90s, during the, the X Factor, when was, or what was that branch of the government. No, the, the private investigations version. He's one of the primary players here. It seems like every issue tends to spotlight a different character. The first issue was focused on Magic, who does play a role in the whole miniseries. Warren Warrington III, who really, like, wow, oh my gosh. The thing about this guy is, this guy does nothing right now. He's not even part of the main X-Men team. There's also mentions in here about the X-Corporation. Now, you're probably asking, Nick, what is the X-Corporation or X-Corp? It was a company that was basically first showed up in Grant Morrison's one for New X-Men. It was a company that had branches all over the world, like Hong Kong, Singapore, the U.S. Mostly they were there to help protect mutant rights, because basically at that point there was a big expansion on, like, there was a lot more mutants popping up at that point. Mutants pop up a lot, but not as rapidly at that point. Men to protect their rights, and the fact it was an actual company. And it was thanks to this company that it was brought up in the run that Cyclops had a psychic affair with Emma Frost at the Hong Kong branch. Yeah. Oh, here's talking about alien plants versus Marvel mutant zombies. Yeah. That's a big tagline for this thing. Yeah, it's basically the, the core T... The alien plant people just come to Krakatoa, and this mostly put was what the other X Men were up to. Now the only time you had your X Men, you actually had the main X book tied into Empire. Yeah, the main X book, and this is just a mini series what everybody else was up to during the main event. Mm -hmm. There was also one point these group of senior citizens show up, a bunch of old ladies, who decided to a gas on the men, making them young. Despite the fact they're not. One of them claimed she was actually magic, which I thought that was kind of dumb. Yeah, so I have a magic, and basically, like... Yeah, this is just so weird, this one. It's by far the most oddest tie-in of the entire event. Yeah, it is so freaking odd. Yeah, these, these old ladies just hijack their gates and they have to fight them in the very next issue in order to get back the gates. And they do, in fact, get them back. One of them does show up again, but man, they, these old ladies really are just not that interesting of characters. Oh, let's spray some gas on the guys thinking they're smoking hot, even though they're not. Yeah, it's kind of like... They're here, distracting from the action. And here's the thing about the, the issues that they pop up in. Yeah, they pop up in issue two, and it's not done by John. Like, I don't think Hickman want anything to do with these ladies at all. Nope, that's the guys in one. Yes. And then we have Black Tom Cast. They bring in Mr. Sinister. I think that's supposed to be Celine. Mastermind. Lady Mastermind, Quintum Guitar Exes, the Separate Cuckoos, and the Shadow King. Yep, the deal with the plant people. Yep, that is seriously what the purpose of this is. Yeah, a bunch of plant people. Yeah, it's just a very weird mini series. Oh my gosh. Black Tom Cassie plays a bit of a role in this, which is quite nice. We have Magic turned into a smoking hot demon, which is awesome yep it is like the fight scenes are excellent about this miniseries is me between Scarlet Witch and well Doctor Strange and we had this really cool ending to this one which I love this like let's see if I can get to it here and I believe it happens here in a second uh no, it doesn't happen. It actually happened just recently. Where Hickman, uh, I think it was one of the writers, undid something the Brick Commander did. Yeah, it's nice that Scarlet Witch plays a small role in this. Even though she's not an X-Man. But the only reason why she's part of Krakatoa is because she's mutant. And I love the fact they actually keep her in a regular attire. 
Yeah, in our regular Scarlet Witch size. They don't change her attire. Yeah, that's a regular outfit that she wears. Yep. This is a okay miniseries, per se. It's not terrible. I mean, the best thing about this is the fight scenes between the X-Men and the plant people. That was interesting. The only thing I don't like about this is the five old ladies showing up. Like, what was the purpose of these old ladies? Seriously. I'm not sure whose bride they was. I don't think Gary Duggan. I don't know. This may have been an editorial thing. But these old ladies were a distraction. I did not care for these old ladies at all. And thank God, basically, they had one issue. Excuse me. One of them did pop up again at the end of the miniseries. But the rest? Yeah, these old ladies had no business in this crossover at all. Like, I forgot these ladies were even here. I read this miniseries last year when it came out. And I did not remember these old ladies being here. Like, oh, let's put, throw in five singers and five old ladies in here for no reason. Just basically have them interrupt the action just to do their own nonsense and, and hijack gates that are basically meant for mutants. Are these ladies mutants? Uh, no. Then why are they here? Yes, it's completely pointless. But the fight scenes are good. The artwork's actually really good. I like the writing other stuff, but not the old ladies. This book, roughly 8.5 out of 10. The only reason I'll give like a 9 or 9.5 because of stupid old ladies who really were there or a big distraction. And I'm reading this, I'm like, just go away, you old, you old ladies. Just go away. The readers don't want you here. You're not interesting. You're not the X-Men. Go away. These old ladies had no business being here. And where the heck did they get that freaking gas from? Heck, the X-Men are actually really unhappy with these ladies, the way they're written. It's almost like they didn't want to be here. I'm sure the readers, but anybody who read this miniseries last year, probably felt this though. Yeah, this particular... Now, they probably did this because they probably wanted to, because it feels as though the writers did enjoy doing this. But the old ladies... Uh, that may be something that probably, I don't know, maybe some editor probably told him to do it because the way it's written in here, you read this, and you're like, man, these old ladies are just a distraction. Like, they have no business being here at all, and thank God they leave the one issue. Yes, for one of the tie-in miniseries, yes, surprisingly, Empire actually had a couple miniseries tie-ins to it. And you're probably thinking, Really? Yes, really. Yeah, it's mostly like a lot of tie-ins. Like, a lot of tie-ins. Like, it's most like a lot of ongoing series tie-ins. It's mostly a few ongoing series tie-ins to it. But mini series I have from this one. There was one for... Avengers, Captain America. I read the Captain America was actually really good. I enjoyed that one. It was also one for Fantastic Four. The only thing I had reviewed, uh, aside from this miniseries, is just X-Men, Captain Marvel. And that's it. This is the first miniseries I've reviewed so far. And man, it's just okay. At best. It's interesting though, there was actually other miniseries planned for this crossover that were canceled through the pandemic last year. Like, there was a once plan for Ghost Rider. That would be interesting. And Vage of Econo, which I think this would basically follow up with the H. Econo series. It was only for Spider-Man. That would have been interesting. He does play a role in Fantastic like Four time. Squad Supreme, Stormbringer. This may have been a beta rebuild book. Empire Thor. That would have been interesting. Strike Force. And, well, the first three issues of Union, which is basically later added as part of King in Black. Yeah. And it's something, though, for Empire Trades, this is two out of uh, th uh, four. Mm -hmm. Yeah, two out of four. The only two left are Lords of Empire, which contains all the one-shots for Empire, and the other two miniseries, which is Captain America and the Avengers, between Captain America and Empire Avengers. Yep. But yeah, not much else to say about this. Just, just okay. Okay, so... That's a particular review. Stay tuned later on for my reviews for To Love of Darkness, discussing the OVAs. Okay, take the video. Bye.